Today we're interviewing Luke Edwards from The Telegraph. Luke, who's a national reporter, has been following Newcastle for many a year. He's an avid Leighton Orient fan and he can empathise with Newcastle fans for the way the club has run. We began by asking Luke why he went on to talk sport to defend the city of Newcastle after Ian Abrahams declared there's nothing else to do on a Saturday except watch football in the city. I think um, it, it, it was about more than the football club for me really. I mean, I, you can tell from my accent I'm not from here originally, uh, but I came to university up here uh, a long time ago now, 20 years ago, um, and I love it up here and I think it's... Um, Coming from London, there, there are there are negative perceptions of the North East, and I don't just mean Newcastle, I mean the whole of the North East and what it's like. And I thought Ian Abrahams, aka the Moose, strayed into. I just thought it was insulting. I thought it was ignorant. And Geordies and, and people from the North East in general, they're not they're not naturally inclined to bo to boast where they're from, really. And I just felt that defend the honour of the North East might be a bit too strong. But I just felt the need to. It just angered me. Um, you know, when you've got 53,000 students wanting to come and study here every year, when a uh, rough guide have uh, voted you the must place, must see place to visit of 2018, and we, we all know what a fantastic place it is to live up here. So I just wanted to address that really more than just about the football club. You can have a go at the football club if you want, but don't have a go at the city when you know nothing about it. And I see he's been up here, isn't he, milking it for all it's worth, um, pretending that he's been on some educational exercise to find out what the North East is like. So it just annoyed me, uh, and I'm pleased that TalkSport gave him the opportunity to address it, and uh, I think his own colleagues called him an idiot on air, so I think we won that battle. Now, as I was saying earlier on in the video, is that Luke is an avid Leighton Orient fan and he only knows too well how bad his club has run because of bad ownership and he can empathise with Newcastle fans. Certainly two years, well, no, actually less than that, about a year, 18 months ago, I thought Orient were actually going to go out of business. It was that bad. Um, taken over by a very shady Italian businessman who worked in refuse collection, which I think if you've ever watched Sopranos might, um, might give you a clue as to his background. Um, but he's gone. I think we, you know, we almost went out of business horrendous. I think what's happened to Newcastle is slightly different. It's been sort of a slow, slow death, isn't it? It's a kind of slow, painful suffocation. Um, but yeah, I do have a lot of sympathy. This football club, and when you live in the city, again, when you're talking about why I went on Talk Sport, when you live in the city, you realise how important this football club is and how special it is as a football club because the whole city kind of throbs to the sort of fortune to the, of the team, as it were. And I think when the team's doing well, the city seems to be doing well as well, and the atmosphere in the city is great. So. It shouldn't be a club that's just meandering along, battling against relegation every year. It's too big for that. I've written countless times before that if you were a foreign billionaire, if you had a billion pounds lying around, there's not many of them around, but if you had a billion pounds, this is the one last football club worth buying because if you get this right, if you can get Newcastle back into the top four and compete for trophies, there isn't. I don't think there's a better place to play football, and I think this city would just benefit hugely from it as well. So that's my dream. That's what I, that's what I'd really like to see happen before I retire. So I've probably got about another 30 years of working, um, and that's what I'd like to see Newcastle back in the top four and, and challenging for trophies. Now, recently, Mike Ashley's been making headlines. We've seen him at Crystal Palace. He's there. We've seen him at Leicester City. He was also there. Why is Mike Ashley all of a sudden turning up to games? At first glance, I said it was slightly strange that he was there with his three stooges. I think I called them Justin Barnes, uh, Lee Charnley and um, Keith Bishop. But I think having spoken to Rafa about it and, and been able to reflect on it for the last few days, I think it's probably a positive, you know. It was a, I think it might be a positive. I think it's if he's going to re-engage, as Rafa says, I think that's what they need him to do, really, in terms of... I don't think he's going to meddle in the day-to-day -day affairs, but they need to spend some money in January. We all know that, and they need to keep Rafa Benitez. And I think... Believe it or not, if he's more involved in the day-to-day -day running, I think that's actually more likely to happen, rather than when he leaves it to his people who he employs, who are pretty clueless on the, on the most part. Um, I think that that's more worrying. I think if he engages directly with, with Benitez, I think that hopefully, I mean, this is Mike Ashley we're talking about, but hopefully that can be a positive. We all know that Mike Ashley is a massive problem for us to progress, but will Rafa Benitez go on and sign his contract extension beyond this season? I still have a gut feeling that he will, yeah. Um, he loves the city. He actually loves the football club. He has, and I've, I've written this before, but he has something at Newcastle that he hasn't had for probably since he was at Liverpool, which is that he could lose five games in a row and the fans would still be singing his name. And I think managers of his experience appreciate that. Um, I think he wants to stay, but he's not going to stay and be insulted and, and made. You know, he doesn't want to be in charge of a football club that's going to be battling relegation every year. He wants to see some sort of plan. 
some sort of reassurance that the club wants to grow and it wants to improve because he wants to turn Newcastle into what I think we all think they should be, which is a certainly a top ten Premier League team, one that can have a real go at the cups every every season and and, can, and hopefully starts every year thinking we can qualify for Europe. So I think if he gets that sort of reassurances that that's going to happen. I still think he'll sign the contract. If they try and play games with him again, if they do what they've done in the last two transfer windows, which is effectively ignore him uh, and not give him the money, there is money to spend. Um, they got involved in this, um, I call it a willy-waving contest really, about who's going to sign, who's going to sign, you sign your contract and we'll spend the money. Um, he will say, no, you spend the money and you sign the contract. I think they got stuck in that. It broke everything down, the relationships deteriorated. There's a lot of mutual suspicion there at the moment, but I think that can still all be ironed out. And I think if he gets back to January if they give him what he wants in January and they they say that they're going to do this training ground improvements that he wants and a, a radical overhaul of the academy then I think in, in Rafa Benitez's heart he wants to stay at Newcastle United the only way he won't do it is if Mike Ashley mucks it up another topic which Newcastle fans talk about is does Mike Ashley really want to sell a club we've seen it with the, the smoke screen with the Chinese investors we've seen it with Amanda Staveley fell through the latest one is Peter Kenyon does Mike Ashley really, really want to sell the club? I, I, I think he does want to sell it, but, and again, we go back to the Amanda Stavely stuff a year ago. He's not going to sell it unless he gets a good deal. That's what Mike Ashley's all about. He's all about making a profit. He's all about getting the best deal he possibly can for himself. He's not just going to give it away to somebody on the cheap. That's not going to happen. That's not who he is. So I think he does want to sell. I don't think he's quite as desperate to sell as he was this time last year. Um, but if someone was to come in with £350 million and just paid him the cash, I think he would say, I think he'd be gone tomorrow. What we have seen is that nobody wants to do that. I think dealing with Mike Ashley, from what I've heard, is very, very difficult. I think the asking price seems to fluctuate quite a lot. Um, but yeah, if someone was to offer him the money and it was a good deal for him, he'd walk away tomorrow. Look, we're all sceptical of whatever Mike Ashley says, but you know, he hasn't backed Rafa Benitez in the transfer market. We know we're struggling at the moment. We know that we need players for the door, and January is going to be a big, big thing for us. Will Rafa Benitez be backed in January? I think they will strengthen because I think they have to. The, the only time we've really ever seen Mike Ashley be truly adventurous or bold in the transfer market is when relegation has been a threat. Um, the only black mark on that is if you remember the season they last went down, they signed, um, spent a while, they spent a lot of money in the January, didn't they? And they still went down. But I think they will spend. I think what they need, they desperately need number 10. Um, I can't understand why they didn't sign one in the summer because for me that was probably the priority position. I don't think the Rondon transfer at the minute looks a great one. Um, not because he's a bad player, but I think he's just injury prone. So you've effectively, they're very, very short in attack and I think that's where they're, where they're going to have to strengthen. You could probably see them needing two players to come in and then I think they'd probably want to strengthen, certainly bring in cover for Dummett. Um, and probably sign another right back as well. So the two full backs and two attackers. I think four players. I don't. I don't even think it's a case of they have to back Rafa Benitez. I think they have to spend money and strengthen the squad in January. Otherwise, they were in real danger of going down. To finish tenth last season with that squad was was pretty remarkable. And it was it was actually nip and tuck. If you remember, there they went that dreadful run before Christmas, and we were all worried about worried about relegation then. Um, so. I think they're going to have to strengthen. It's just what they do. I mean, this is Mike Ashley. If he mucks this up in January, I think they, they could quite feasibly go down and lose Rafa Benitez all in the space of six months. And then where is this club going to be? Another big worry for Newcastle fans is if that a big transfer come in for Jamal Lascelles, 50, 60, 70 million, who would sell him? Would it be the club's decision or would it be Rafa Benitez's decision? Could Newcastle turn that down that kind of money? I think Rafa would be, would be tempted to sell him for 50, 60 million if he was told that he could reinvest that money. I don't think they would do it in the middle of the season. Um, I just don't, I think that's too risky. I think the squad is too short at the moment anyway um, to, to allow a player to leave in January. But you never, I mean, if someone were offered 60, say maybe started pushing 70 million, the sort of price Van Dyke went for, I think Rafa Benitez would sell him. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the sales went next summer if they get a really good bid for him. Um, I think he's had his head turned this summer. Hopefully he's refocused now and we, we, he's you know, delivered a really good performance at Crystal Palace last weekend. Um, he's a player really who I think needs to recognise that he's benefited hugely from having Rafa Benitez as his manager. If you remember in the Championship, he probably wasn't the best of the two centre-backs. He grew and grew last year, wonderful cap brilliant leader and he's getting better and better as a defender um, I think personally he should stay at Newcastle I think that'd be the best place for him for, for his career development certainly over the next two seasons I would have said but I wouldn't be surprised if in the summer if someone offers that sort of money that you're talking about 50 60 million the Newcastle would sell
Now, Kevin Keegan's book's out this week, and he's up on time to promote it with a lot of talkings. Tony Jimenez has come back fighting with some of the comments that is in Keegan's book, and Jimenez has turned around and said that Keegan's actually turned down some big-name world-class players that the club were trying to sign. Tony Jimenez, I mean, if you look at his track record um, of failed business ventures and various court actions taken against him, I don't attach any importance to what that man has to say about Newcastle. I wouldn't attach much importance to what that man had to say about football in general. Um, the Keegan book uh, was written by a friend of mine, Danny Taylor. Um, it, it's good, it's very interesting, I think, for the sort of passionate, informed Newcastle fans. I don't think there's been that much in there that we didn't already know. Keegan was the wrong appointment for that business model. It, it was all, you know, he was treated appallingly by the club, but I don't think he was ever going to accept a head coach role. If you wanted that management structure, that was what was completely wrong. They appointed someone like Kevin Keegan, who wants to be the manager, who wants to spend a lot of money in the transfer market, he wants to excite fans, he wants to galvanise things. He's not someone who, to bring in as they wanted, which was a gradual build project and to effectively answer to two idiots above him. Uh, so it was always going to end in tears. Um, and yeah, I mean, he was appallingly treated, but I think we already knew that. Now, Luke has seen a lot over the years covering Newcastle, so we asked him what was his most memorable moment covering the club, good or bad. I mean, I was very fortunate that I started when Bobby Robson was manager. Um, Bobby, for me, growing up, was a real icon hero uh, of my childhood. It's the first World Cup, I remember, he's 86. Um, so to work with him, those Champions League games were brilliant. And when Newcastle were really the club, I thought they would they could be and they were one of the top four clubs in the country that was a wonderful time I don't think the supporters realized how good it was at the time that frustrated me a little bit I don't think they realized how good Bobby was at the time and, and you might not be old enough to remember but I can remember them being booed off after a home draw against Wolves and they'd finished fifth that season um, so that that was a wonderful time but probably the most memorable um, was probably the Arsenal 4-4 because um, I've not I don't I mean I've as you probably know, I'm a Leighton Orient fan, so I'm not, I'm not a Newcastle supporter, but I actually stood up in the press and I, I said, when, when Newcastle got the first goal, I said to the person next to me, I think it was Paul Fraser from the Northern Echo, I said, the Arsenal have gone here. They've absolutely gone. Um, if, they can, if they can get a second, they'll come back and do it. So I'm not speaking myself up because I predicted it. Nobody could predict that. But it was just incredible. The atmosphere, just remarkable. I mean, just an, just an incredible football match. And when the fourth goal went in, I'm not ashamed to say that I leapt up and down in the press box and high five people and was hugging people. And it was just wonderful. So that that would probably be up there. Um, yeah, that would, that would probably be I think I think the very start of my career with Bobby, it was just brilliant working with Bobby. Uh, and then for a particular game, probably that 4-4. Now, a final question, which is a bit of tongue-in-cheek, is Luke, as I said earlier on, is a well-respected journalist, but how would he like to be remembered by Newcastle fans? Uh, <laughs> irritating. No, no, I'm, um, I don't, that's a really good question. I don't know. I, I'd like to say that I, 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 I was honest. Um, that sometimes I wrote things that they didn't like um, but I was brave enough to have those opinions I think I mean I started on the local post so I worked for the journal for for 11 years before I went to the Telegraph so um, it's a slightly different job I do now I do a lot more in Manchester but and it's not just Newcastle actually and I should say that you know ever since I've started working up here I've wanted all the clubs to do well there's this common misconception that journalists enjoy when things are bad and want to write negative stories oh, there's a few of us who are probably like that but but generally speaking we want them to do well and it's the same when i cover sunderland i want them to do well um and i've just I'd, I'd like them to i would just like the supporters probably of both clubs to remember that i actually much preferred writing about you when things were good than when they were bad and that is it i'm sure you'll agree that was a fantastic interview thank you very much luke for coming on if you want to follow luke on twitter his handle is luke edwards telly and you can read his articles at thetelegraph.co.uk. Thanks, Luke, for coming on. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Bye-bye.